Our England is a garden that is full of stately views, of borders, beds and shrubberies, and lawns and avenues, with statues on the terraces and peacocks strutting by. But the glory of the garden lies in more than meets the eye. For where the old thick laurels grow along the thin red wall, you'll find the tool and potting sheds which are the heart of all. The cold frames and the hot houses, the dung pits and the tanks, the rollers, carts and drain pipes, with the barrows and the planks. And there you'll see the gardeners, the men and apprentice boys, told off to do as they are bid, and do it without noise. For except when seeds are planted, and we shout to scare the birds, the glory of the garden, it abideth not in words. And some can pot begonias, and some can bud a rose, and some are hardly fit to trust with anything that grows, but they can roll and trim the lawns, and sift the sand and loam, for the glory of the garden occupieth all who come. There's not a pair of legs so thin, there's not a head so thick, there's not a hand so weak and white, nor yet a heart so sick, but it can find some needful job that's crying to be done, for the glory of the garden glorifieth everyone. Then seek your job with thankfulness, and work till further orders, if it's only netting strawberries or killing slugs on borders. And when your back stops aching and your hands begin to harden, you will find yourself a partner in the glory of the gardener. Oh, Adam was a gardener, and God who made him sees that half a proper gardener's work is done upon his knees. So when your work is finished, you can wash your hands and pray for the glory of the garden, that it may not pass away. And the glory of the garden, it shall never pass away. Kipling's poem compares England with a flowering garden. And that perception of his country is typically English. The green hills of England truly are reminiscent of enormous lawns, as if they had been cut by a squadron of giant lawnmowers. The enormous, centuries-old trees are like historical monuments. The fields, dotted with white sheep, involuntarily bring to mind the thought that both gardeners and artists had a hand in their creation. But without doubt, the pride of the country and the national passion are the English gardens and parks which the English have lovingly tended for centuries. England, which has not been overly endowed with artists, sculptors and architects, gives the impression that the artistic talents of the country have been embodied in the art of gardening. And in this, they have reached perfection. It is well known that England was the home of the Industrial Revolution. The processes of industrialization and urbanization began here earlier than in other European countries. Nevertheless, there are close ties with nature, and in particular, its plants. The incarnation of this unity is the Green Man, a popular character from English mythology, the spirit of the forest, the personification of living nature. Even nowadays, he can often be found on the walls and ceilings of churches, on pub signs and in souvenir shops. Branches, usually oak branches, grow from his mouth and he is both frightening and amusing. This pagan image, which was worshipped by the ancient Druids, has been taken into the English church and recognised by contemporary atheists. According to some specialists, even the legendary Robin Hood is none other than the very same green man in a new guise. And as the May King, he is glorified in English villages on the 1st of May. In a more romantic form, along with his female companion, they celebrate the summer equinox in June. And he is the playful Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream. The Green Man has many faces. He is above time and space. 
He is the English love of the forests, fields, flower beds, lawns, of all that is green and alive. The ancient cult of trees is also alive in England. In public parks, villages and private gardens, old trees are looked after and cherished. They are treated as living, close beings, and sometimes, as for example in the park at Laycock Abbey, they even talk to frivolous visitors. Oaks, which have since ancient times been considered magic trees, are particularly revered, and special care is taken of them. The Druids themselves endowed the trees with magical properties, and mistletoe, which sometimes grows on oaks, was cut with a golden sickle, and was considered to be the most powerful of lucky charms. Nowadays, sprigs of mistletoe decorate houses at Christmas. The Slavophile, Alexei Chemikov, wrote in the 19th century, I know that other nations have, of late, started to imitate English parks and gardens, but these imitations are not at all like the originals. And do you know why? For a very simple reason. Greenery and trees are an ancient love of the English people. History has forced them into big towns, but in their souls they are still village dwellers and fanatical lovers of shady trees. And furthermore, the trees which the English love also love them back. Wonderful parks and groves sprang up around them, providing dense shade and showering wonderful inspiration on their poets, from old Shakespeare to our contemporaries. Plant symbolism is closely intertwined with English history. How often do wars bear the names of flowers? The War of the Roses, between the red and the white, was an important turning point in English history. At the end of the war, Henry VII Tudor took the Red Rose of the Lancasters and joined it with the White Rose of the Yorks by marrying Elizabeth of York in 1486. The result was the two-tone Tudor Rose, which became the emblem of that royal house and, particularly during the reign of Henry VIII, decorated many houses throughout the country. The rose is undoubtedly the queen of the English garden. My beautiful English rose was for many centuries a term of endearment. And Shakespeare's Juliet has the following lines in one of her monologues. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. The nightingale in Oscar Wilde's tale gives its life for a beautiful rose, the eternal symbol of love. And today the rose, the queen of flowers, is considered to be the flower of England, just as the leek is the symbol of Wales and the thistle for Scotland. Flower symbols can be found throughout England. The famous English porcelain of the Victorian period, which is still used and in great demand to this day, is called Royal Albert and bears a design including old sorts of English rose. Decorations in houses, churches, historical monuments and pubs all contain flower themes. In ancient times, Tribes created enormous, complex structures in England. Ring-like forms, symbols of the sun and eternal life, and maybe something else, which is unexplained to this day, stand on English soil and are the subject of much debate and speculation. The most famous of them is Stonehenge, but there is an older ring at Avebury, and many others as well. In the Middle Ages, these circular constructions were reborn in a new guise as mazes in parks which were planted for people's entertainment and pleasure. And to this day they are a favourite of the English. This ancient closeness between people and nature, which many contemporary nations have lost, has become in England a passion for gardening.
During the Tudor period, so-called knot gardens were extremely popular. These contained complicated designs made of low-growing evergreen bushes, often in the form of knots. Knot gardens are a purely English invention. Much in the art of English gardening, it would seem, is based on the principle that the harder it is, the more interesting it is. Nowadays, these old-fashioned gardens are coming back into style, and a number of park museums are creating whole works of art out of bushes and flowers. The reign of Elizabeth I, in the second half of the 16th century, was the golden age in gardening. English gardens were in glorious bloom, in both the literal and the figurative sense. The aristocrats tried to stay one step ahead of each other, desperate to please the Virgin Queen. A favourite garden might, for some, be the start of a good career. This was also the period in which the Grand Tour was born, the instructive trips to Europe, and one of the immediate results of this was the appearance in England of Italian gardens, to which the English remained loyal for a long time, even though they transformed them in the English manner. It was the Italian gardens that were the source for one of the favourite motifs in English garden, topiaries, bushes clipped into various shapes. As a pastime that was difficult, time-consuming and required a special mastery of technique, it could not fail to appeal to the English. England is not Italy, but the English are not in the habit of coming off second best. They not only brought the art of Italian gardens to perfection, and have kept many of its forms right up until the present, but they also created that which they did not have in England. Thus, they were creating follies, false ruins, in the 18th century, which was a source of amusement to other Europeans. Italian gardens in England were more Italian than those in Italy. The only thing that the English could not resist was their many beloved flower beds and multicoloured flower borders, even if, as a result of them, classical gardens immediately lost any trace of classicism. By the end of the 16th century, a number of gardeners had already become important people in English society. John Tredescant and his son and follower, John Tredescant the Younger, are good examples. They were not only gardeners, but also scientists, collectors and tireless travellers. This was the period in which there were extensive explorations and discoveries, and it is therefore not surprising that exotic plants became, and have remained, an important part of English gardens. It is believed that Tredescant the Elder himself brought lettuce, acacia and lilac to England. In England we've been breeding these oriental poppies from, uh, which come from northern Turkey for a century. So the basic colour is this, which is a sort of orangey red, and we've bred this dark red one, some wonderful pinks. This is uh, one called Julianne. This is one called uh, Cedric Morris, which has been around for about 60 years. Very beautiful colours in, in this flower, the black and the, the rather dirty pale pink. Um, and then there's a darker pink one here, which is called uh, Lilac Girl. It's not lilac, like it's a sort of, lilac's a sort of bluey colour, but um, it's called Lilac Girl because a nurseryman decided to call it that. And you can see those are all more or less the same colour, which is a very interesting colour, given that you started with this orange. They're very different. Um, but this is, I think, my favourite. I love the colour, and it's called Raspberry Queen. John, who was considered to be the greatest gardener of his time, has even left his mark in Russian history in the form of the popular and extremely modest plant which bears his name, the Tradescantia, or spiderwort. Furthermore, he visited northern Russia and left one of the earliest descriptions of the plants in the North Sea region. Russian bread and the intoxicating honey had the most positive effect on the Englishman. The meat he found tolerable, and the beer insipid. But the most pleasant impression 
was nevertheless made on him by the plants. Among many others, he noted the dog rose with its wonderful aroma, cloudberries, which are similar to strawberries but amber in colour, currants, much larger than ours, and many others. The search for exotic plants was not devoid of its bizarre moments. In Tredescant's time, there was a popular story among gardeners about a strange plant that grew on the banks of the Volga River. If we are to believe the stories, hog suckery, in Russian baranets, was half plant and half animal. A lamb, linked to the rhizome by a stalk umbilical cord, would break forth from the bud. It could only eat that grass which it could reach, and when there was no more, it would die. One traveller brought a coat made from such mystical creatures back to England. The coat was considered to be worth its weight in gold and was carefully guarded. The church in London where the Tredescans, father and son, are buried is now surrounded by the Museum of Garden History. Opened in 1977, it still remains unique with not another museum like it anywhere in the world. Around it, a garden is laid out with plants that used to grow in 17th century gardens, the period when the Tredescans were at their height. The Museum of Garden History was set up in 1977. Um, it was founded by uh, Rosemary Nicholson and her husband John, who discovered the, the church here, the building, um, that was just about to be turned into a car park uh, for Lambeth Palace. Um, the Nicholsons uh, rescued the building from um, imminent destructure um, and uh, turned it into the world's first museum of gardening history. Um, the um, inspiration for founding the Museum of Garden History was the discovery in the garden of, um, the, to of the tomb of the John Tredescant's father and son, who were the royal gardeners back in England in the medieval, in, in the 16th, 17th centuries. Um, it was the discovery of their tomb, which is still intact in the garden, that led to them founding the Museum of Garden History here on this site. The church that we're in um, is the old parish church of Lambeth, um, and has been the parish church of Lambeth since the 14, 1500s. Uh, the oldest part of the church is in fact this corner of the tower here, which dates back to the 11th century. Um, other parts of the, the old church building were added on over th the next 500 years after that. Um, the roof and most of the more modern stuff dates from the Victorian era. The roof is completely Victorian. All the stained glass windows, lovely as they are, are in fact post uh, Second World War because they were all bombed out during the Blitz. And in 1983, the Queen Mother personally opened a knot garden, created by Lady Salisbury to surviving drawings and a copy of the garden Tredescant laid out in one of the English estates. In the 18th century, parks and gardens became a favourite subject for English philosophers, artists and writers. Naturalness and closeness to nature, free growth of all the plants, under strict control of course, these were the principles that lay behind the new artistic wave. The revolution in English gardening is linked with the name of Lancelot Brown, also known by the nickname Capability Brown. He would frequently tell his patrons that their estate had great capabilities for creating a park. And it was his fearless hand that swept away the formal symmetrical parks created in the French style and created in their place the famous English freeform landscape parks. Their naturalness, as has already been noted, required painstaking work and active interference in nature. But Brown was convinced that there was nothing impossible and that you could always redo nature to your own design. His decisiveness knew no bounds. In 1763, under his direction, a whole village was moved to a new place because it had been right where Brown had planned a picturesque lake. However, 
natural parks actually required far greater effort, means and control on the part of the gardeners than the formal parks did. It should be noted that nowadays, with Brown's creations being restored and cherished as true examples of English artistic creation, there are some who think that he should have been more careful and not simply remove the wonderful formal gardens from the face of this green island. When creating these parks, various new techniques and means of landscaping were used. One of these, which was thought up by one of Brown's contemporaries, was the Ha Ha, a ditch lined with bricks, that made it possible to have a park without walls. This allowed you to create a view without boundaries, so that the park flowed into the surrounding countryside and merged with it, and at the same time, protected the park from unwanted intrusions, by sheep and cows, for example. This principle is still alive today. Each little garden melts gently into the surrounding hills, giving the impression of an endless space. Brown's fame was unlimited, as was his ability to work. He was able to recreate the estates of many famous English families, such as the Duke of Marlborough. His estate at Blenheim, not far from Oxford, is a perfect example of Brown's gardening genius. And it was in the pavilion in this very park that one of the Duke of Marlborough's most famous descendants, Winston Churchill, proposed to his future wife. During the Victorian period, a real gardening mania gripped English society. Gardens became accessible to the masses, and each little cottage now had a green, cosy garden. Right at the beginning of Victoria's reign, the famous English flower beds came into fashion, and they are still considered to be unsurpassed, both for their artistic composition and for their sheer number. They were indispensable in the cities, particularly in London, which was unfortunately known for its poor ecological standards and smog. Simple and complicated, flower beds were accessible to people at all levels of society and became an omnipresent and pleasant decoration in English homes. Nowadays, all you have to do is go for a walk through one of London's central parks on a spring day and you will be left in no doubt that the art of planting flower beds is alive and flourishing in the country. Victorian gardens became the symbol of English cosiness. During this period, family values stood at the very centre of all that was important. The Queen led her subjects by example. Happily married, she was a passionate gardener, and her love was shared by her husband, Prince Albert. The royal children received a standard set of presents, a bucket with rakes and spades, so that they could join in the family idyll from an early age. Finally, the 20th century further strengthened the English love of gardens and gardening. Amidst an unstable world that was breaking into ever smaller pieces, the garden was an oasis of quiet and stability. The more the artificial worked its way into life, into food, clothes, everyday life, the more English gardeners would strive towards the natural in their gardening. The famous English lawns are also the subject of national pride and reflect many sides of the English character. First, their devotion to traditions. There is the famous joke when an Englishman is asked how he managed to achieve such a beautiful lawn and he replies, oh it's very simple, you just have to water and cut it every day for 400 years. The joke is not that far from the truth, although for example, the French believe that the English simply put down a new lawn every night. Nowadays, it is of course possible to buy a ready-grown lawn in shops. Secondly, it says a lot about the freedom-loving nature of the English, since you can freely walk on such lawns and the grass does not get trampled down. English lawns have long been envied by others. Yekaterina Dashkova, an associate and friend of Catherine II, president of the Academy of Science and a passionate Anglophile, wrote, Their lawns, or green carpets as they call them, are more dear to them than any formal garden, because not only do they cut the grass once a week with the finest of blades, but on top of this, they also smooth it out with large cylinders made of wooden planks, which makes the grass as clean and as smooth as a real carpet. 
True, there were also skeptics. The famous writer Ivan Goncharov saw this excessive naturalness as a rape of nature. I shall not say anything about the English countryside. Show me the countryside. It does not exist. Everything is done in such a way that it all lives and grows to a timetable. People have taken possession of it and have smoothed away all traces of freedom. Fields in England are like painted floors. The trees and the grass have been subject to the same treatment as the horses and the bulls. The grass has the impression, colour and softness of velvet. In the fields there is not a square inch of unused land. In the parks there is not a single bush that has not been planted by hand. Today, gardening is the greatest of the English national pastimes. A significant part of an English person's life is spent in gardens and parks. The English do not just go for walks there, they declare their love, play games, go on picnics. English gardens are wonderful and worthy of imitation. The beautiful garden created by the famous gardener and writer Christopher Lloyd is a wonderful example of a modern English garden. Great Dixter is one of those amazing gardens in in England and of course in England there's a great tradition for gardens and, and a lot of history associated with them and there are gardens everywhere, everywhere you turn there's a garden. But what makes this place really special is a number of things. It's first of all the history because it's designed um, by Edwin Lutyens. It's got a wonderful atmosphere, wonderful structure. Um, as you walk around the garden you see that it's, you go from one compartment to another. It's got a framework of buildings, um, the stonework, everything has got a certain atmosphere to it. So it's great to start off with that structure. As well as that there's the tradition of plantsmanship, of people who love plants and want them to, to express their own personality. And so that is a bonus on, on, on top of that. But the really special play, thing about this place is that it's somebody's home. So you don't feel as though you're entering into a museum piece or into a botanic garden or anything. You're entering into somebody's home where they have expressed themselves in their own sort of way. They've gone out and put the plants in the way that they want to put them. Put them. And so Dixter has got this wonderful atmosphere. And I think great gardens are not just made up of a collection of rare and beautiful plants or a collection of interesting educational purposes um, within a garden. They're made up of a, of a number of, of things. Sense of place and atmosphere is really, really important. It is. It's a real garden and it's always changing. Uh, Christo is such a good writer because his garden is so good and because it changes all the time. Just because something looks good one year doesn't mean we'll do the same thing year after and again and again. Um, we'll try something new the next year. It might not work, it might be better, it might work. Uh, and that gives him a source of inspiration to write. It's a place where we experiment all the time with plants. It's a place where we want to try out new combination, new ways of, of of showing off plants, new ways of using them. So it's a place that is dynamic, it changes from year to year even though the structure remains the same. It's a place where we have a lot of fun with plants and we don't take ourselves too seriously even though we are very very professional about the job we do. But we think well if people say you can't put pink and yellow together we think well why can't you put pink and yellow together? In nature in a meadow you, you find pink flowers and yellow flowers and of course there's a base layer of green in there so in the garden it should be the same because what happens in this country is that too many people make too many rules about what you should do in your own garden. They say oh you must play by the colour wheel pinks and blues and mauves and silvers go together but you couldn't have red with white you couldn't have pink and yellow together or you couldn't have red and magenta together well a garden is an expression of your own personal creativity so why can't you have it it's your garden after all and as long as um, you're not doing anything just purposefully to shock somebody or doing some something just sort of to, to be alternative you can do what you want in, in your own garden so Dixter does that the passion for gardening has gripped all classes of English society. In order to assess the miraculous combinations of flowers, the forms and the smells of an English garden, you do not even have to pay money to go into a museum. 
You just have to walk through some small village, anywhere in the country, in order to admire the refined and unique private gardens. Back gardens are an expression of the soul, not a request for praise. Everything possible has been done so that private gardens can bloom with splendid flowers. There are a multitude of shops, markets and garden centres which sell everything a gardener may need. There are various gardener societies. In fact, there are so many that it is impossible to count them all. This is a meeting of gardeners in the village of Broadway and today they are discussing important questions such as the best way to get proper compost when making it yourself. It's, it's extremely popular and what's happening now is that a lot of people are that perhaps have gone into the city to be accountants or, or, or um, lawyers and things are getting fed up with being in the city and being in what we call the rat race. So they're having a change of career and they want to take life at an easier pace. So they are middle-aged people that are swapping to become gardens and we find that they are very, very good people because they're focused, they want to learn, they want to improve sh straight away. And as, along with that, those sort of career change people, you're getting lots of young people that are training at horticultural colleges to, to become gardeners. Yesterday I was sowing seed, um, pricking out seedlings, and it's sort of, it's a very sort of satisfying to job to, to, to sow a seed and to watch it grow and then to pot it on and then plant out in the garden. And for people to appreciate it, it's, you know, it's just really nice. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an excellent job. I feel, you know, I feel really lucky that I chose this career path. The most famous of the gardening societies in England is the Royal Horticultural Society, founded back in 1804, and still a diligent proponent of this wonderful activity in England. And it was upon the initiative of the RHS that the first flower show was organised in the middle of the 19th century. In 1913, it moved to Chelsea, and is now one of the most important social events in the English calendar. The flower show was held throughout World War I as a sign of resistance to evil. It was halted during World War II as a mark of mourning. And finally, it celebrated a magnificent festival in honour of the Golden Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 2002, once again underlining the devotion to the monarchy and good old England. Today, the Chelsea Flower Show is a huge event. Tickets are sold well in advance of the first day. The traditionally restrained English cannot control their passion, and here it breaks out onto the surface. Gardening's in English people's blood, really, it's, and they, they're always regarded as producing the best gardeners, whether or, or not that's true. In this day and age, who knows, there are a lot of very good gardeners out there. And in England, gardeners are respected, if you're a skilled gardener, if you're a skilled person that could sort of maintain a garden or manage a garden up to a certain level, you are not treated like a king, but you're very much respected. But then you've also got gardeners that aren't respected. They're badly paid because they, they've got a certain skill level and they're, as in any country, they're looked down on. But the best gardeners of are almost regarded as pop stars in, in a way. They've got a following, they've got a fan club, they've got people you know, sending them fan letters and photographs being taken. And, um, but they have to earn that position in order to become a good gardener. You have to spend years learning. You can't just come out of university or college and expect to be a good good gardener straight away. It takes years of, of nurturing, of, of knowledge being passed on to you, or you just trying and experimenting and finding out from, from trial and error. Um, it's easy to become a gardener in England, um, but it's a, a, a more difficult job to be a good gardener. English gardens are a constant game with space and nature. They are the possibility to make the small big, the wild tame, and the regular complicated. In each little garden, in front of each house, various views of nature are recreated, 
and already the garden does not seem so small, and the hills into which the garden melts become endless, and the whole island is one wide open space. This beauty of being able to nurture things, to grow them, to get them to a flowering size, and then take it from there. That's the real essence of it, you know, this sort of wanting to be a part of nature, although you can, you're controlling nature all the time by being a gardener. But it's just this sort of being able to, I suppose we all got that in us, in being a parent and bringing this thing up to a flowering size so that it looks good, it does what it should do, it's healthy, and then the whole cycle continues. You know, I'm, I'm not just interested in flowers, I'm interested in vegetables, I'm interested in the insects that are there. And one thing, I'm interested in the people who do it as well, because they're all characters in their own little way, and they've all got the sort of like this personality, and, and, and I'm interested in, in the way they, they sort of convey their personality in their gardens, that's fascinating.